<coughs> Shalom out of Arnix. Welcome to our next session in the book of Isaiah. We are in session number six. Now we're working our way through the book of Isaiah using Ariel's exegetical outline notes developed by Dr. Arnold G. Fruchtenbaum. So let's take a few minutes to review where we were last session. All right, last session, we finished up chapter one by looking at a section of scripture that dealt with the tribulation, the second coming, and the kingdom all kind of combined together in one tight little package, kind of hard to separate them. But then when we got into chapter two, we spent four, uh, four verses in the kingdom. So a nice little visit to the kingdom in chapter two, verses one through four. So what did we learn? in chapter two. Well, we learned some, about some features of the Messianic Kingdom. First of all, we learned that about Millennial Mount Zion in chapter two, verse two. We also learned that Jerusalem would be the center of Gentile attention in chapter two, verse two. Jerusalem would also be the center of spiritual knowledge, chapter two, verse three. Number four, we also saw that Jerusalem would be the capital city of the planet and the center of justice in chapter 2, verse 4. And then in chapter 2, verse 4, a very nice, uh, a very nice feature to learn about, there'd be no military and no warfare in the kingdom. So that's where we were in chapter 2. Now let's continue on where we were in the kingdom in verses 1 through 4. Now we jump back in verses 5 through 11 to the prophet's present time. So what has been described is going to be true of Jerusalem in the future. But now Isaiah contrasts the glorious future with Israel's, Jerusalem's pitiful present condition. So Zion's pathetic, <coughs> pathetic present condition and the judgment to follow will be in chapter 2, verse 5 through chapter 4, verse 1. Now before we go on, I'd like to share with you a little quote from the Bible Knowledge Commentary that brings out a very important, a very important principle that's going to be found throughout the book of Isaiah. So let me run through this quote with you. The commentator states, throughout this section, that's chapter 2 verse 6 through chapter 4 verse 1, and many others in the book of Isaiah. So I want you to note that this is going to happen over and over and over again as we go through the book of Isaiah. Throughout this section and many others in the book of Isaiah, there is an interesting interplay. That's what we're going to see, an interplay between two items. An interesting interplay between the judgment which the Lord will inflict on the nation by the Assyrian Babylonian captivities and the judgment that will come on Israel and the whole world in the last days, just before the millennium. So there's our two judgments, localized with um, Benjamin, uh, Benjamin, localized with Babylon and Assyria, and then worldwide at the, uh, just before the millennium, worldwide during the tribulation. Now the commentator goes on, probably Isaiah and other, the other prophets had no idea of the lengthy time span that would intervene between these, those exiles and this later time of judgment. Though many of the predictions in chapter 2, uh, verses 10 through 21, happened when Assyria and Babylon attacked Israel and Judah, the passage looks ahead to a cataclysmic judgment on the whole world when he rises to shake the earth. So remember, that's our interplay between the Assyrian and Babylonian attacks and the, as a judgment upon the nation, and then a cataclysmic judgment upon the whole world world when God judges the world. Now that's a very nicely worded principle. I thought he was well did a did a good job there, but I'd like to reword the principle in a little more simple terms. It can be a little overwhelming if you're not too familiar with the material. So in other words, the principle can be worded like this. What happened in Isaiah's day will happen again during the tribulation period only much more severely. Let me repeat that. What happened in Isaiah's day will happen again during the tribulation period only much more severely. Localized in Isaiah's day, worldwide uh, in the, in, during the tribulation period. Because, now, this is the reason for the movement back and forth among the time frames. He'll start out in his current time frame, the present time, then he'll jump to the tribulation period. Then he'll go back to his current time frame and then he'll jump to the tribulation period again. And the message, 
the message we're getting is that what happened in Isaiah's day will happen again during the tribulation period only much more severely. There, have I burned it into your brain? I hope so. Keep this in mind. This is very important. That's why I've emphasized it so strongly. All right, so he's going to warn his contemporary of a, contemporaries of a massive future judgment to come. But to begin with, we start with the call to Israel, a call to return to the Lord in verse 5. Come, house of Jacob, and let us walk in the light of the Lord. So in light of chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, in light of the Messianic kingdom, he now turns to Israel with this request. Come. You know, Gentiles will say this in the future. So why not Israel now? How much more should God's covenant people be saying come? In Isaiah's day, in our day, in the future. Now there'll be a sharp contrast between the two Jerusalems, the Jerusalem of Isaiah's day and the Jerusalem of the future. So here's that contrast. Isaiah's Jerusalem and Messiah's Jerusalem. In Isaiah's Jerusalem, we, ha we are characterized that the nation is characterized by apostasy. The city is characterized by apostasy. In Messiah's Jerusalem, the city will be characterized by the fact that God's truth will reach the world from this city. In Isaiah's Jerusalem, the characterization was idolatry. But in Messiah's Jerusalem, God alone will be worshipped, not idols, not false gods, but the true and living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God alone is worshipped. In Isaiah's Jerusalem was characterized by war. Messiah's Jerusalem will be characterized by peace. Again, Isaiah's Jerusalem characterized by material trade. Messiah's Jerusalem characterized by spiritual blessings. And then finally, during Isaiah's Jerusalem, the prophets will share prophetic foresight, foresight, in order to warn the nation about its future. Keep going down this road and you're going to be judged. But in Messiah's Jerusalem, the prophets will bring prophetic insight so that the, the inhabitants of Messiah's Jerusalem can understand their role, understand her role in the kingdom. So Jerusalem can understand where she fits in and what she's to do in the kingdom. So prophetic foresight and prophetic insight, the two basic sites of the prophet, of the prophets. All right, that's the contrast between Jerusalem of Isaiah's day and Jerusalem of the kingdom. All right, so the reasons for the call now is brought out in verse 6, and the reasons for the call is the sins of Israel. And there are three reasons. Verse 6, for you have abandoned your people, the house of Jacob, because they are filled with influences from the east. And they are soothsayers, like the Philistines. And they strike bargains with the children of foreigners. All right, the first reason for the call is the occult practices of the nation. Here's the map of Isaiah's political setting. So they are uh, practicing the customs of the East. That means they're practicing the religions of Edom, Moab, and Ammon. They're influenced by the practices of these Eastern countries. And then the West, they're acting like the soothsayers found in Philistia, the Philistines. So they're acting like the nations on the West. So the southern kingdom is making common cause with heathenism. That's the problem. And that'll be true in the future. And, you know, unfortunately, it is true today as well. Uh, this was an article I, um, I scanned in from the Jerusalem Report in October 20. 2003, so it's, it's a, a bit of a dated article, but back in 2003, the headline was, Meditation Goes Mainstream. Why did they entitle the article in that manner? Well, that's because Israelis are all drafted into the army. They have a two-year draft, draft obligation, and after that obligation, many of them go to India and eastern countries and come back, you know, they want to see the world, then they come back with eastern meditation and Eastern religious practices. And that's what's happening in these two pictures. Now this beautiful Israeli girl on the left is meditating. But what is she meditating in front of? Well, look at here. She lit a candle and she's meditating in front of this little idol. Is that a Buddha? I don't know. It might be a Buddha. I have no idea. It's some kind of a little Eastern idol of some sort. And uh, that's something the article stated as being 
pr prevalent in Israel were Buddha, Buddhist, the B Buddhist faith, and the article named uh, three variations of the Buddhist faith, Tich Nachan, Bahavana House, and the Israel Center for Mind-Body Medicine. Now whether Buddhist uh, influences is in Israel or not today in 2018, I can't tell you for sure, but I can tell you I doubt if it's gotten any better. And there's also, in, at least in 2003, Hindu philosophy in Israel, the Ashram Bamid Bar, also Kabbalistic and Hasidic meditation at the place called Bamakom, and even the secular Israelis are getting into it with mindfulness-based stress reduction. So here are all the, the variations, or a number of variations, of meditation Eastern type meditation that's in Israel in 2003 and like I said this is 2018 but I don't I doubt if things are any better so what's the point all this is based on turning inward to find God within turning inward to find God within not turning outward to the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob but turning to yourself basically making mankind God making yourself God so that's a pretty sad situation for the Israelis to be in. True today. It'll be true in the future. All right, what's the second reason for the call? The second reason for the call is foreign wealth. A huge supply of foreign wealth in verse 7. Their land has also been filled with silver and gold, and there's no end to their treasures. Their land all has also been filled with horses, and there's no end to their chariots. So what's mentioned here, silver, gold, and horses in abundance. The nation is prospering. The nation is prospering. But this is an obe in disobedience to Deuteronomy 17, 14 through 17, which states that the king, the government, shall not increase to himself horses and gold and silver. And so the nation in Isaiah's day, Jerusalem in Isaiah's day, is experiencing outward prosperity, but inward apostasy. Keep that that. Uh, description in mind too. Outward prosperity, inward apostasy. Okay, that's the second reason. All this foreign wealth that's coming into the country. The third reason is idolatry in verse 8. Their land has also been filled with idols. They worship the work of their hands, that which their fingers have made. Idolatry. Now the word translated idols is the Hebrew word elilim, which means nothings non-entities. They're objects with no reality. These little objects have no reality behind them, these little idols. The God whom all nations will follow has been exchanged by his own people for non-entities. True in Isaiah's day, true today, it'll be true in the future. And remember I've shown you this about the truth of it today. There's these uh, this article from Biblical Archaeology Review. Here are these three ladies, uh, excuse me, four ladies, and they're dancing and worshiping in front of this little clay idol, a non-entity, and they're th they were thanking it for life and fertility, etc. Thanking a piece of clay. In other words, idolatry says, I'm back, I'm back in the land. And I doubt if things have gotten any better since that article. All right, so because of all that's going on, there's an announcement of judgment. This is the consequences of Judah's, Jerusalem's, pathetic present condition. So the first announcement of judgment includes humiliation in verse 9. So the common man has been humbled and the man of importance has been Abased. So those bowing down to idols will bow down to the mighty hand of God. And they will not be forgiven, also in verse 9. But do not forgive them. You see, there comes a time when God ceases to strive with man. He draws a, draws a line in the sand. You cross over that line and judgment will come. In verse 10, there's terror. Enter the rock and hide in the dust from the terror of the Lord and from the splendor of his majesty. That's verse 10. So there's going to be terror involved in this judgment. And then 11, the results of the destruction. The proud look of man will be abased and the loftiness of man will be humbled and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. So the results, man's pride, brought down, humbled, but God 
exalted, God lifted up to his proper place. All right, at this point, we do a rather abrupt time frame jump. And we're going to jump from the prophet's present time in verse 11, clear down to the tribulation period in chapter 2, verse 12, to chapter 4, verse 1. And again, the point, the point, what happened in Isaiah's day is going to happen again in the future, only much more severely. This is our principle coming to life. So now, now here's, here it is in written form for you. What happened in Isaiah's day will happen again during the tribulation period, only much more severely. Okay, Bob, you say, okay, okay, I get it, I get it. Well, you're going to hear this from me again and again. <laughs> All right, let's move on then. So we're going to now take a look at the day of the Lord and the sins of Israel, chapter 2, verse 12 through 21. We're going into the future. And the future state of the nation will result in this purging. And the future state of the nation is going to be outward prosperity and inward apostasy. Verse 12, the day of reckoning. For the Lord of hosts will have a day of reckoning. This is a title for the great tribulation. God has a special day of judgment reserved for sending out his vengeance. And this judgment must uh, pre precede the kingdom mentioned in verses 1 through 4. So then God lists what he's going to judge, starting in verse 12. First of all, the attitudes of men. Against everyone who is proud and lofty, and against everyone who is lifted up, that he may be a base. So the attitudes of men will be judged. Also, the environment will be judged, the trees. And it will be against the cedars of Lebanon that are lofty and lifted up, against all the oaks of Bashan. This judgment will come against the planet itself, in verse 14, against the lofty mountains, against all the hills that are lifted up. But it won't stop there. There'll be a judgment against mankind's military strength, against every high tower, against every fortified wall. Those are the defensive towers and, and uh, military um, uh, defenses of, of a city. And then finally, in verse 16, the judgment will come against business, economics, and wealth against all the ships of Tarshish and against all the beautiful craft. So what will God judge during the tribulation period? He's going to be judging the attitudes of men, the environment, the planet, military strength, business, economics, and wealth. These are all the things in which men trust in. These are all the things to which men flee to hide. And so there'll be five results of the day of the Lord, five results of the tribulation in verses 17 through 21. So we start in verse 17 with a parallel statement to verse 11. The pride of man will be humbled and the loftiness of men will be abased and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. So what happened in verse 11 happens again in verse 17, only much more severely. Secondly, verse 18, there will be a disappearance of idolatry. The idols will completely vanish. See, the root cause of the problem is going to be removed, turning to something other than the Lord. So this is parallel to verse 8. What happened in Isaiah's day will what? Happen again in the tribulation or in the future, only much more severely. There will be a shaking of the earth as well in verse 19. Men will go into caves of the rocks and into the holes of the ground before the terror of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty when he arises to make the earth tremble. So the caves are natural caves. The holes are subterranean excavations such as man-made bomb shelters and bunkers. But this verse is parallel to verse 10. And this whole aspect will be more fully develop developed when we get to chapter 24 through 27. Then in verse 20, there'll be a repudiation of wealth and idolatry. Remember the repudiation of wealth? Okay. In that day, men will cast away to the moles and the bats their idols of silver and their idols of gold, which they, for, they, which they made for themselves to worship. So this is just like in verse 7, idolatry and wealth are discarded. And this shows what was done with the excess gold and silver that they had. It was accumulated, and the result was idolatry. Idolatry was created. This money was spent on idols, on expensive idols. 
And so these expensive idols will be repudiated. And finally, in verse 21, we come to the hiding in the earth. Again, fulfillment of verse 10, parallel with verse 10, I think it was, in order to go into the caverns of the rocks and the clefts of the cliffs before the terror of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty when he arises to make the earth tremble. So there's a hiding in the earth, but it's worldwide. Notice he arises to make the earth tremble. So again, what happened in Isaiah's day will happen again in the tribulation period in the future, only much more severely. In Isaiah's day it was localized. In the future it will be worldwide. Worldwide. All right. So it's apparent from this overview that we can expect Israel to prosper right up to the tribulation. Now this does not mean it's totally smooth sailing. This does not mean Israel's going to get a rose garden. For example, the Russian invasion will come in Ezekiel 38 and 39. They're going to have to face that, but Israel will survive it all, and Israel will prosper through it all. And so the future of Israel should approximate what we see today. Outward prosperity, inward spiritual and moral corruption. And remember, that phrase, outward prosperity and inward apostasy, is a perfect description of Israel today as well. Not only in Isaiah's day, not only today, but that'll be a description of Israel in the future. You know, in fact, as we think about today, Israel today is a secular nation. 85 to 90 percent of the Israelis are atheist or agnostic. 10 to 15 percent, that's all, possess any kind of an interest in God. And only 1 percent or less follow Yeshua as the Messiah. All right, so this brings us to a time to do a little bit of drashing. Remember I told you we'd do some drashing? So here's an application, some thoughts of application from Isaiah chapter 1, verse 5 through chapter 2, 21. So here's the way I do the application. I first settle down on a theme that, that summarizes that section of scripture. And the theme I chose uh, was the necessity of knowing God. This may not be the only theme in that section, but it's a theme I happen to choose. As you read it, you may, God may, the Holy Spirit may impress upon you a different theme. But this is the one that, that um, I chose to use. How did I generate that theme? Well, the biblical data, the biblical application is summed up in this paragraph. The great tribulation will come upon Israel because they do not know or consider God in their lives. Most Jewish people today, excuse me, most Jewish people then, in Isaiah's day, and now, in our day, our future during the tribulation, do not have a personal relationship with God. Most Jewish people do not consider it important. Then and now, many practice a form of worship, but it is not worship acceptable to God. It is simply empty ritualism based on the traditions of men, not on Holy Scripture, then and now, many simply don't believe in God. Today, 85-90% of the Israelis, Jewish population worldwide, is either atheist or agnostic. So that's, uh, that's the biblical data. Now, instead of criticizing Israel, let's personalize this. Instead of criticizing Israel then and now and in the future, let's look at ourselves. Do we consider God and have a close relationship with Him? The basis of that personal relationship is a personal commitment of yourself to Jesus the Messiah as your Savior from your sins. If you have not done that, I urge you to consider that. I, consider, I urge you to consider doing that right now. Ask Yeshua to be your Savior. Admit your sin and your need for Him. Okay? Please consider doing that. Now, if you've already taken care of the sin issue, Let's go on and consider all the blessings God has brought into your life. Israel had been brought up and matured by God, but they didn't appreciate his care. We are being brought up and matured by God today. Let's consider and appreciate all that he's doing for us. Now let's move beyond personal application. Let's put some, some uh, rubber to the road here. Let's develop a plan of action around this application. Perhaps you could list the blessings God has brought into your life recently or over the years. Think about them. Consider them. Write these blessings down. Then write down something practical you could do to thank God for these blessings. 
and increase the quality of your personal relationship with Him? What could you do in response to all that God has done for you? Just some thoughts of application out of this section of the book of Isaiah. Please consider these thoughts and make this book more practical in your life. We're not here just to have, uh, just to stimulate our minds. We're here also to put what we learn into action. All right, in regard to the time, we're in the tribulation period. This is a continuation of the explanation of the day of the Lord and its results. And so now we come to the indictment and judgment of the leaders in chapter 2, verse 22 to chapter 3, verse 15. And here, Yeshua, excuse me, here Isaiah starts a theme that's taken up by Yeshua, a theme that's taken up by Jesus in the Gospels, that the leaders of Israel lead the people astray. That's the basic idea. The people, the leaders of Israel lead the people astray. So in verse 22, Isaiah begins with renouncing trust in man. Verse 22, stop regarding man whose breath of life is in his nostrils, for why should he be esteemed? Okay, cease from trusting man. Don't depend on man. This is the call. Why? Is his breath is in his nostrils. His breath is the whole foundation on which his confidence rests. And his breath is weak. It can be taken away in a split second. And the whole point is that man is frail. Man is incredibly frail. And Psalm 103, verses 14 through 16, emphasizes this. Psalm 103, 14 through 16. For he himself knows our frame. He is mindful that we are but dust. Not a very flattering assessment of mankind, is it? I think a lot of humanists and atheists would really would take issue with that. But that's all we are. We are just dust. And uh, it goes on in verse 15. The psalmist goes on in verse 15. For man, his days are like grass. We're like grass. As a flower in the field, so he flourishes. And when the wind has passed over it, it is no more. And its place acknowledges it no longer. No memory. No memory of the dust, no memory of the grass, no memory of the flower, gone. So that's mankind, frail and weak. So why should he be esteemed? What's, what's the worth of man as a source of confidence? Zero. And what, at what rate is he to be judged? Zero. So now he begins an explanation of his judgment and that explanation of his judgment will consist of the removal of all competent leaders and the assumption of government leadership in the community by incompetent leaders and the results of such a change. So we begin with an announcement of the famine of food in verse, chapter 3, verse 1. We're now into chapter 3, starting chapter 3. Verse 1, For behold, the Lord God of hosts is going to remove from Jerusalem and Judah both supply and support, the whole supply of bread, the whole supply of water. Now this is the reason, the reason for verse 22, because Israel is trusting in men and not in God. And this uh, announcement of famine is a curse of the Mosaic Covenant. We talked about the Mosaic Covenant. This is one of the curses of the covenant. And then the term supply and support, uh, it's the same word in Hebrew, only one word is masculine and one word is feminine. And these two forms together imply totality. And then bread and water is mentioned. This is the two basic necessities of life. Then in verse 2, there's a list of the supports to be removed. Verse 2, the mighty man and the warrior, the judge and the prophet, the diviner and the elder. So there's a famine of leadership as well as a famine of food. Competent leadership will be removed. So uh, they're listed, the leadership is listed. The mighty man, that's the military officer. The man of war, that's the man experienced in war. So the military leadership is going to be removed. And then the judge. Judges are appointed to administer justice, so the legal leadership is removed. The prophet and the diviner, the religious leadership is removed. And then the elder, social leadership is removed. We go on to verse three, the captain of 50 and the honorable man, the counselor, and the expert artisan, and the skillful enchanter. So the captain of 50, that's the lowest commanding officer in the military. So the military is going to have competent leadership removed at all levels, from top to bottom. 
The honorable man, that's a man of influence. That's again, social leadership will be judged. The expert artisan, this is the, the men and women in skilled in arts and crafts. So artistic leadership or perhaps skilled workers are going to be removed. And then the skillful enchanter. This is the occult leadership. Those who are leading the Jewish people to worship the idols and things like that. And so the, the competent leadership will be removed and in verses four through seven, incompetent leadership will replace them. First of all, in verse four, and it will make mere lads their princes and capricious children will rule over them. So we'll have childish, immature leaders. Uh, in verse five, an anarchy will be present and the people will be oppressed, each one by another and each one by his neighbor. The youth will storm against the elder and the inferior against the honorable. So that's a description of anarchy, of chaos and disorder. Then the next result, there will be a search for leadership. Israel will, clave, cr cl will crave leadership, but the requirements will be very, very basic. When a man says to his brother in his father's house, saying, you have a cloak, you shall be our ruler, and these ruins will be under your charge. And how does he answer? And he will protest in that day saying, I will not be your healer, for in my house there's neither bread nor cloak. You should not appoint me ruler of the people. So the, the uh, qualifications are pretty low. If a man can provide for himself food and clothing, that's qualifications for leadership to become a leader in Israel. And the reason for this judgment, this is all the effects of sin in verses 8 through 11. So Israel's downfall is due to sin in word and deed, verse 8. For Jerusalem has stumbled and Judah has fallen because their speech and their actions are against the Lord to rebel against his glorious presence. So a uh, literal rendering of that last phrase would be, they provoke the eyes of his glory. In other words, it shows rebe uh, brazenness and deliberate rebellion. Remember God's eyes, God's eyes are continually on the actions of his people. He sees everything, no, nothing escapes him. But these people are oblivious of their sin in verse nine. The expression on their faces bears witness against them and they display their sin like Sodom. They do not even conceal it. Woe to them, for they have brought evil on themselves. So their face, their countenance, makes no attempt to hide the sin. They possess no shame. You know, like this gal, she's expressing shame, hiding her face for whatever she's done. That is, won't be in existence in, uh, in the future, in the future. And instead, the nation is very adequately called, very appropriately called spiritual Sodom and they have through their sin destroyed themselves because sin brings its own destruction. But in contrast, there'll be a blessing for the righteous in verse 10. Say to the righteous that it will go well with them, for they will eat the fruit of their actions. In contrast, there'll be a woe to the wicked. Woe to the wicked, it will go badly for him, for what he deserves will be done to him. And the principle here is we reap what we sow, whether good or bad, what goes around comes around. What we, what we reap, what we sow, we will reap. Excuse me, I had that backwards. What we sow, we will reap. We reap what we sow. What goes around comes around. Blessings for the righteous, woe for the wicked. And so, in conclusion, there's a condemnation of the leaders in verses 12 through 15. They are ruled by children and women. O oh, my people, their oppressors are children and women rule over them. So the leadership is immature, and those who should be subordinate in that culture lead. And the sin of the rulers is brought out in verse 12 as well. Oh, oh, my people, those who guide you, lead you astray and confuse the direction of your paths. So it's the leadership who is responsible for leading the people astray, the people follow. And so now in verse 13, God is prepared to judge. The Lord arises to contend and stands to judge the people. He is ready willing and able to pass judgment. The nation has stepped over the line in the sand. Then in verses 14 and 15, the leader's sins are expanded even more. They're spoiling the vineyards. This will be developed in chapter five. The Lord enters into judgment with the elders and princes of his people. It is you who have devoured the vineyard. The plunder of the poor is in your houses. What do you mean by crushing my people and grinding the face of the poor, declares the Lord God of hosts. 
So these words are reminiscent of the, of the uh, parable of the vineyard in Matthew 21. That vineyard was rented out to others. And those, those who rented out the vineyard spoiled the vineyard and ended up being judged. So Jesus picks up the same theme here. The theme is his struggle with Israel's religious leadership, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So not only are the men in poor moral shape, but arrogant pride is evident in the women as well. So there's an indictment and judgment of Jewish women in verses 16 through chapter 4, verse 1. So a denouncement of female haughtiness, verses 16 and 17. The haughtiness is described in verse 16. Moreover, the Lord said, because the daughters of Zion are proud and walk with heads held high and seductive eyes and go along with mincing steps and tinkle the bangles of their feet. All right, so they're haughty. This means they're exceeding their authority. They've been instigating their husbands to carry out the previous sins of the leadership, the previous sins that have been mentioned. And they wear these jewels in abundance to display their haughtiness, their pride. And they walk around um, with um, their nose held up in a proud, proud posture. You know, so confident of themselves. Of themselves. And finally, they go around, Isaiah says, with wanton eyes, leering looks. They're making unseemly attempts to attract men. And so the judgment comes in verse 17. Therefore... The Lord will afflict the scalp of the daughters of Zion with scabs, and the Lord will make their foreheads bare. In verse 17, they trust in their beauty. That's where the judgment will strike them. The scab destroying their beauty. Then the verse says, he will lay bare their nakedness, or perhaps it says he will lay bare their foreheads, as in the NASB. Translators are not sure the best way to translate that, either nakedness or foreheads, but it doesn't really matter which way you translate it. The point is this, their beauty will be destroyed. Their beauty will be destroyed. And then in verses 18 through 23, there's a list of the items that they are trusting in. There's a list of the items they're lusting over. 21 items are gonna be listed, and these are all expensive items. To get them, they instigated their husbands to despoil widows and orphans. For what? For clothes, jewelry, and cosmetics. Here we go. In that day, the Lord will take away the beauty of their anklets, headbands, crescent ornaments, dangling earrings, bracelets, veils, headdresses, ankle chains, sashes, perfume boxes, amulets, finger rings, nose rings, festal robes, outer tunics, cloaks, money purses, hand mirrors, undergarments, turbans, and veils. That's all the items that the women craved. And that's going to change in verse 24. In verse 24, these are going to be removed and replaced. Now it will come about that instead of sweet perfume, there will be putrefaction. Instead of a belt, a rope. Instead of well-set hair, a plucked out scalp. Instead of fine clothes, donning of sackcloth. And branding instead of beauty. Quite a change. They're going to change from beauty to wretched-looking prisoners disfigured by ill treatment and dirt. In the place of spice and fragrance, there will be the fragrance of mold and rot. Instead of a girdle, they'll have a rope thrown over them as a prisoner, binding them as a prisoner. Instead of well-set hair, they'll be bald. Instead of a fancy dress robe, sackcloth. And instead of beauty, branding. Branding by the conquerors. So the judgment is brought out in verse 25 through 4.1. The judgment is detailed. First of all, there'll be a decrease in the male population in verse 25. Your men will fall by the sword and your mighty ones in battle. So there'll be the death of the soldiers. And the result will be that Jerusalem will be desolate in verse 26. And her gates will lament and mourn and deserted. She will sit on the ground. So Jerusalem is personified as a desolate woman. And then the women will experience reproach in Isaiah chapter 4, verse 1. For seven women will take hold of one man in that day, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own clothes. Only let us be called by your name. Take away our reproach. And uh, it was a, a reproach in those days to be um, unmarried and childless. So take away the reproach of our unmarried state and our childless state. So the women are going to seek 
husbands instead of vice versa. And they will not demand the legal minimum required under the Mosaic Law, but they will provide for themselves the basic necessities of life. So during the tribulation period, there'll be such a massive decrease in the male Jewish population that seven women will seek to be married to one man. And of course, the cause in the, in the reduction of the manpower, men, will be the wars that Israel will participate in during the tribulation, as indicated by verse 25 of chapter 3. So that's the judgment. Now Isaiah continues on now past the second coming, and he moves on into the messianic age. So we're in the tribulation, he jumps over the second coming, and he camps out in the kingdom again, because he doesn't leave us in despair. He, God never leaves us in judgment, but he promises that the result of all this will be the kingdom in verses two through six, the messianic kingdom. And he begins by describing the kingdom as he brings to the forefront the messianic person in chapter four, verse two. The messianic person is described using the symbol of a fruit tree, Isaiah 4, 2. In that day, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth will be the pride and adornment of the survivors of Israel. So the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and honorable. It'll be a shoot of, of the Lord himself. And so this points to his divine nature. And this will be developed in chapter 11 very, very, uh, in a very detailed way. Chapter 11 is a messianic prophecy stating that the Messiah will be the God-man. And at this point, Isaiah introduces the branch doctrine, the branch motif. So let's take a quick look at this. The branch motif, we'll talk about the scripture, we'll make a remark about it, the theme that's uh, brought out, and the gospel that repeats that theme. So we begin in Zechariah 3.8, where God says, My servant is the branch. My servant, the branch. Now listen, Joshua, the high priest, you and your friends who are sitting in front of you, Indeed, they are men who are a symbol, for behold, I'm going to bring, you, bring in my servant, the branch. And so the theme here is servanthood, and this is picked up by the Gospel of Mark. Yeshua is the servant of the Lord. Then in Zechariah 6, 12, God brings in the man who is the branch. Then say to him, thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, a man whose name is Branch. For he will branch out from where he is, and he will build the temple of the Lord. This is the basis for the Messiah building the millennial temple right here. And so the theme is manhood, humanity. He's a man. And that's brought to the fore by the Gospel of Luke. In Luke, Luke talks about Jesus, the ideal man. All right, let's move on to the next uh, section. In Isaiah 11:1, 1, God says, I will bring the branch from the stump of Jesse. He'll be a choter, which is useless, and a netzer, which is valuable. So what is all this about? Isaiah 11.1. 1. Then a shoot, a choter, will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch, a netzer, from his roots will bear fruit. All right, what's going on here? Why is this significant? Well, this is an olive tree. I photographed this uh, tree at Neot Kedumim, oh, a number of years ago. <clears throat> And here's the definition of a choter. A choter is an olive tree offshoot that grows out of the trunk of the olive tree. It is a sucker. That's a sucker. And therefore it's considered useless except as a shepherd's staff. And so here's our olive tree and there is a choter growing out of the, out of the uh, stump, out of the, um, the trunk of the olive tree. Notice it's thick and strong there so it can be used as a staff, a shepherd's staff. So that's a choter, but what is a choter? It's called in Isaiah there as a suckling. A suckling grows out of the trunk of the tree and too many sucklings is gonna suck the life right out of the tree. The tree won't bear as good a fruit because it's putting its energy into these new branches. So what do you do with sucklings? They're considered useless, so you trim them off, you cut them off. That's what happens to a choter. Now, here's another olive tree. And now we get the definition of a netzer. A netzer is an olive tree offshoot that grows out of the roots of the olive tree. It's considered valuable and it's carefully guarded because it can be transplanted and become a new olive tree. So here we have 
are net setter. See, it's coming out of the roots. It's actually popping up out of the ground there. So this little guy can be transplanted into a new and independent olive tree. So it's very, very valuable. That is a net setter. Now the theme is the stump from Jesse. So the theme is kingship because Jesse was the father of David. And of course, uh, the kingly line comes Jesse, David, and his sons. So the theme is kingship. Ma Ma um, excuse me, Matthew picks up that theme in his gospel. Jesus is the Messiah King. Now let's take a look at another one, Isaiah 4.2. This is our branch, uh, this is the verse we're looking at now, we're studying. In Isaiah verse two, 4, verse 2, the branch is the glorious branch of the Lord. And we've read this verse already. In that day, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth will be the pride and the adornment of the survivors of Israel. And so the theme here is God. The branch will be the God-man. He's associated with God's glory, and that's what John states in the book of John. John picks that up very nicely. And then in Jeremiah 23, 5 and Jeremiah 33, 15, we learn that the branch will be David's righteous branch, King David's righteous branch, Jeremiah 23, 5. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. And then at Jeremiah 33, 15, in those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch of David, of King David, to spring forth, and he shall execute justice and righteousness on the earth. That's the job of the king, execute justice and righteousness. So the theme is again kingship, and that's the theme brought out by Matthew. Yeshua is Messiah King, Messiah King. So let's summarize the branch motif with this chart. The branch motif teaches us that the Messiah will be a servant, he will be a man, he will be a king, and he will be God. He will be the servant king, the God-man. He covers every base, doesn't he? Servant king, God-man. Yeshua is just amazing, isn't he? All right, that's the branch motif in brief, in brief. But I, I want you to note, especially that the branch is honorable and glorious at the second coming. He's honorable, that means he'll be accepted by Israel. He'll be glorious, That's, he means he'll be associated with the Shekinah glory. So let's contrast the first and second coming of Messiah. In the first coming, he is a choter. In the second coming, he is a netzer. In the first coming, he's despised. In the second coming, he's honored, he's honorable. In the first coming, he's rejected. In the second coming, he is accepted. And in the first coming, he comes in veiled glory. He allowed his glory to be seen at the transfiguration just for a short time and just for a few disciples. The rest of the time, his glory was veiled. But in the second coming, he comes with unveiled glory and the brightness of the Shekinah. What a difference. What a difference between the first and second coming. So it says the fruit of the land will be majestic and glorious, and this points to his divine nature because he's associated with the Shekinah glory. And here in Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 through 17, we see, John sees, and then we get a chance to see through his description, the unveiled glory of Yeshua. John writes, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to his feet, and girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white like white wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. There's the unveiled glory of Yeshua. Wait till we see him, folks. You know what we'll do when we see him? When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. <laughs> Everyone who sees the unveiled glory of Yeshua does exactly that. And if they don't, they probably haven't seen the unveiled glory of Yeshua. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his right hand on me saying, do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. This is a very typical reaction 
when God appears in all his glory. Now it also mentions in this verse that he will be glorious and majestic from the escaped of Israel. Now this is a re reference to the one-third of the Jewish worldwide Jewish community that survives the tribulation. And that uh, very sobering fact is brought out in Zechariah 13 verses 8 and 9. Zechariah shares with us, it will come about in all the land, better translation will be world, come about in all the world, declares the Lord, that two parts in it, and he's referring to the Jewish community here, that two parts in it will be cut off and perish, but a third will be left in it. 66% of the worldwide Jewish community will perish, and 33% will be left in it. And I will bring the third part through the fire, and refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested, they will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people, and they will say, the Lord is my God. And this introduces us to the doctrine of the remnant. So we, uh, you should be familiar with the doctrine of the remnant. And in order to uh, provide more information for you, I would recommend you pick up the Messianic Bible study from the Messianic Bible Study Collection of Ariel Ministries, Messianic Bible Study number 191, The Remnant of Israel, Past, Present, and Future. That would be a good bit of material to pick up and, and be familiar with the remnant concept. And just in summary, we'll quote from the Messianic Bible Study number 191. The doctrine of the remnant, the doctrine of the remnant of Israel means that there are always some who believe within the Jewish nation as a whole and all those who believe constitute the remnant of Israel. Thus there are two Israels, Israel the whole and Israel the remnant. Ethnically the two are the same, but spiritually they are not. The remnant at any point in history may be large or may be small, but there's never a time when it is non-existence, except immediately after the rapture, probably for just a short time after the rapture, there will be no members of the remnant uh, available, no member of the remnant, no believing Jewish person on planet Earth. And then many will come to faith as well. So the doctrine of the remnant speaks of Israel as a whole. If this circle speaks of all, 100% of the Jewish people, then within that circle is the remnant of Israel. Ethnic Israel uh, is identified as Israel as a whole and Israel the remnant, but spiritual Israel, the remnant, is a distinct subcategory within Israel as a whole. So in Isaiah 10 verses 20 through 22 we read about the remnant as well. Now in that day, and we'll, get, we'll, deal this, we'll deal with this in more detail when we get to chapter 10. Now in that day the remnant of Israel and those of the house of Jacob who have escaped will never again rely on the one who struck them, but will truly rely on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. So that's the fate of the remnant, it's a good fate. A remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. For though your people, O Israel, may be like the sand of the sea, only a remnant, see, one-third, only a remnant within them will return. Why? Because the destruction is determined, overflowing with righteousness. God is going to judge all unrighteous people to the Jew first and also for the Gentile. All right, that's the remnant doctrine introduced. So the messianic person has been described in verse 2, and now the messianic people come into view in verses 3 and 4. And their primary characteristic is explained in verse 3. And it will come about that he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy, everyone who is recorded for life in Jerusalem. So they shall be called holy, the remnant who escape. Why are they called holy? Well, one aspect, most clearest, clearest aspect, is Romans 11, 25 and 26. For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. At the end of the tribulation period, every living Jewish man, woman, and child will place their faith in Yeshua and will be spiritually saved. Just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion, he will remove ungodliness from Jacob. 
So every Jewish person will be holy, will be saved. Sin, uh, their sins will be forgiven. And so holiness is the key emphasis. Now, you know, formerly in the book of Isaiah, people were distinguished by rank and position without regard to moral, moral uh, uh, worth. For example, you could have a good king and you could have an evil king, but they were both the king. They were both the king. But now the people will be distinguished by holiness. And they're described as everyone written in the Book of Life. What's the Book of Life? Well, the Book of Life is a heavenly roster with two uses. It records physical life and it records spiritual life. For example, Psalm 139, 16, a record of physical life. Your eyes, were see your eyes have seen my unformed substance. That's, um, that's a conception folks. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance. And in your book, there's the book of life, were all written the days that were ordained for me, the physical days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. So God knows exactly how long each one of us is going to live. And he knew that the moment he created us. That's the book of life recording physical life. But here's the book of life recording spiritual life. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments. And I will not erase his name from the book of life. And I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. So there we have the book of life associated with spiritual life. <sighs> Let's see, did I miss a little bit of notes here? No, there we go. Okay. Now, Isaiah chapter 4, verse 3 is understood as messianic by a number of Jewish sources. And, um, oh, excuse me, I forgot this slide. The book of life is mentioned five additional times in the book of Revelation. So it's a nice theme in the book of Revelation. All right, so now Isaiah 4, 3 is understood as messianic by a number of Jewish sources from the work How to Recognize the Messiah by the Good News Society. Targum Jonathan has paraphrased the branch of the Lord as the Messiah of God. So the branch is the Messianic person, we agree. Rabbi David Kimke, he's a prominent uh, Jewish um, commentator. The, the explanation of the branch of the Lord is the Messiah ben David, Mashiach ben David, King Messiah. As it is written, behold, I will raise up unto David a righteous branch. David the king will have a kingly branch. Dr. John Gill, way back many hundreds of years, writes about what he discovered. Dr. Gill writes, the Targum, which paraphrases the words thus, at that time shall the Messiah of the Lord be for joy and for glory. And he's referencing Isaiah 4.3. And he goes on, and the Septuagint, that's the Greek translation, understand it as a divine person appearing on earth, rendering the words, for in that day God shall shine in counsel with glory upon the earth. So the Messianic person is the God-man. So our position is not strange to the Jewish community. Now the cause of, holy, of the holiness of the Jewish community is in verse 4. When the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and purged the bloodshed of Jerusalem from her midst by the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning. So the Lord will see that the Jewish women's filth is washed away. That's the answer to the haughtiness of the Jewish women. Jewish women full of arrogance during the tribulation, just prior to the tribulation. And Jerusalem's blood will be purged. This is the answer to the problem of violence, the leaders spoiling the vineyard, and the means, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of justice, the spirit of burning or sifting. And that's a reference to the tribulation judgments. And after the judgments, the Jewish people will be holy. Then in verses 5 and 6, the Messianic Shekinah glory comes forth. Now remember, the Shekinah glory is the visible manifestation of God's presence. Normally it shows up as a light, fire, or cloud. So if the omnipresent God, if our omnipresent God chose to reveal himself here, and, and he could, he's omnipresent, he's everywhere. If he chose to reveal himself here, where my hand is, we would probably see a light a fire or a cloud, something like that. So his presence is brought out in verse 5. Then the Lord will create over the whole area of Mount Zion and over assemblies a cloud by day, even smoke, 
and the brightness of a flaming fire by night, for over all the glory will be a canopy. Now there'll be five distinct manifestations of the Shekinah glory in the kingdom. So here's a quick overview of this idea. I believe this chart is in your handouts. The five manifestations of the Shekinah glory in the Messianic kingdom. Number one, it'll appear in the Holy of Holies of the Millennial Temple, Ezekiel 43, verses 1 through 7. Secondly, it will appear over, over Millennial Mount Zion, Isaiah 4, 5, and 6. Thirdly, it will appear around Jerusalem as a wall of fire, Zechariah 2, 4, and 5. Fourth, it will be with Israel. We'll look at this when we get to Isaiah 35 and Isaiah 60. And then it will be in the person of Messiah Yeshua, Zechariah 2, 5. Five manifestations of the Shekinah glory. So first of all, it will cover all of Mount Zion. And this is the aspect that Isaiah is dealing with. And here's a wonderful illustration by a, a believing Israeli artist of the Shekinah glory as a wall around Jerusalem, as a cloud over Jerusalem as well. Now originally the Shekinah glory was over the Holy of Holies and starting with the tabernacle. So here's an illustration of the tabernacle at the base of Mount Sinai and there's the Shekinah glory cloud hovering over the Holy of Holies. And here's another rendition of the tabernacle, the Shekinah glory cloud hovering over the Holy of Holies. And then I like this one especially, cloud of fire at night. Again, the Shekinah glory hovering over the Holy of Holies. So originally that's where the Shekinah glory appeared in the tabernacle. Then in 1 Kings 8.10, the whole Solomonic temple was filled with the glory of the Lord. And here is an illustration of the Temple of Solomon. It looked something like this. And what do we read in 1 Kings 8.10? It happened that when the priest came from the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord. So the Shekinah glory filled Solomon's temple. And it talks about, the verse talked about her assemblies, the people living and this is, this is a reference to the people living on Millennial Mount Zion. To the north will be the priests, in the center will be the Levites, and then in the south will be the Jerusalemites. And of course, Jerusalem will have a special covering uh, by the she Shekinah glory. It will be a cloud of smoke by day. Here it is again. See the smoke that the artist has written, the clouds over the, in the upper right and left corner? So it'll be overshadowing, it'll provide shade by day. It'll also provide a wall of defense against any opposing influences. It'll be a shining flaming fire at night. It'll give light at night, perhaps heat at night, and ward off any hostile powers. So the final statement is, so overall the glory shall be spread as a canopy. Here the visible manifestation of God's presence is described as a chuppah. A chuppah was a chuppah. A chuppah is a covering for the sake of beautifying and honoring that which is covered. It's associated with the Jewish wedding. Here's a wedding with a chuppah uh, honoring it and covering it, beautifying it. And here's another chuppah, and in, indoors, uh, honoring and beautifying the wedding vows, the, the state of wedding, of being married. So that is a chuppah. It'll appear as a form of a cloud of smoke and a blaze of fire and float over Mount Zion. And then God's protection is brought out in verse 6. We know there will be weather on the planet during the kingdom. Verse 6. There will be a shelter to give shade from the heat by day and a refuge and protection from the storm and the rain. So there's going to be weather uh, during the kingdom. And here the shelter or the booth over Zion and Jerusalem is called a sukkah, a, a sukkah. It'll be covered by a sukkah. What is a sukkah? It's a, it's a, a booth or a shelter. Here's some um, sukkot, 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 that's plural. These are put up during the Feast of Tabernacles. The people live in these temporary dwellings and they protect them during the Feast of Tabernacles from rain and wind and that kind of thing. So the sukkah will provide shade from the heat. It'll be God's air conditioning system, countering the hot sun. It'll be a cover from the storm and the rain. It'll be weather protection. It'll be the mountain of perpetual spring. Mount Zion will be the mountain of perpetual spring. 
So these statements indicate that Millennial Mount Zion will not be terribly high in elevation because there will be clouds and weather. It won't be, <coughs> won't be jutting up above the clouds. So the Shekinah glory, here's my illustration. I love it again. Here's the illustration. The Shekinah is compared to a chuppah and a sukkah. The term chuppah emphasizes the beauty of the Shekinah. The term sukkah emphasizes the protection of the Shekinah from weather and from men. And there will be a need for protection from men because there will be a presence of sin in the kingdom. And we see that in um, Revelation 20, for example, verses 7 through 9. When the thousand years are completed, when the thousand years of the Messianic kingdom are finished, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. The number of them will be like the sand of the seashore. And they came up upon the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. So after a thousand years of God's patience, a thousand years of an ideal environment, there will be this final rebellion, and God will not stand for it. He will deal with it summarily. So in closing, and I'm a little over time now, so we'll bring this to a close here. What did we learn about the Messianic Kingdom at this point? Well, we learned of the presence of the glorious Messianic King in verse 2. We learned that all Jewish people will be believers in the Kingdom, also verse 2. That the Jewish people will be holy in verses 3 and 4. And there will be five manifestations of the Shekinah glory in verses 5 and 6. So now we're going to return to Isaiah's present time. Uh, we've been in the Kingdom. And next session, we will jump back to the prophet's present time, and we will deal with Israel, the vineyard of the Lord. So I'm a little bit over time. It looks like my clock says seven minutes over time. So I don't apologize. I hope you've enjoyed the class, even though it's going a little longer than, a little longer than an hour. Anyway, thanks for being our students. We'll see you next session as we look at chapter five. Lahithra Od. Lahithra Ode.